Thank you, Jeff. Um, how are you? Really? Because that's the question I've actually found hardest to answer this year. Every time I've been asked, how are you? How is Civicus? How is civil society? And people assume that I have the answers to questions like that. I've actually been torn between saying abysmally terrified to incredibly euphorically hopeful. Um, and you've heard all the metaphors today, right? The glass is half full, half empty, uh, not what we ordered in the first place. The glass is twice as big as it needs to be. Uh, all, of, all of the different metaphors. But I actually heard Al Gore tell a story recently that I think summed up how I think civil society is right now. And so I'm going to retell it. It's about a farmer driving his horse cart to market with his produce when he gets hit by this huge SUV driving at God knows what, 130 kilometers per hour. Um, and he sues the driver of the SUV and they're in trial in court. And the defense um, lawyer says to him, but is it or is it not true that right in the immediate aftermath of the incident, when the sheriff asked you how you were, you said, I feel fine. And he said, let me explain how that happened. Uh, the sheriff came along, he looked at the scene, he looked at my horse there writhing in agony and said, this horse looks terribly in terrible pain and shot it between the eyes. And then he came to me and said, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> and I think for, <laughs> for a lot of us, the response is, I feel fine in the context <laughs> uh, that we are in. Given how things might have been, we feel fine. Because where we are, and I want to take us back really to the, uh, the, the, the early 1990s. Remember that, I mean, most of us I think are old enough to remember the heady optimism of the fall of the Berlin Wall and how democracy and civil society was now going to flourish all over the planet. And organizations like Civicus were founded to try and expedite, facilitate that process. And that was really fairly quickly replaced by this decade of the so-called war on terror which for legitimate and illegitimate reasons, governments around the world, here in the North, in the South, where, we, where many of us come from, was used as an excuse to systematically roll back some of the freedoms, some of the space, some of the rights that civil society had claimed for itself. Uh, in, if you remember Seattle and the WTO there, for example. Um, and, and and then, and then on top of that, if you remember the, the sweeping vision of things like the Earth Charter, the sweeping vision of the Millennium Declaration, in the aftermath of 9-11, we hunkered down and we said, okay, let's settle for these technocratic little things called the Millennium Development Goals right now, because that's the best we can get in the current context. We, we then settled for literally the impacts of three decades of unchecked market fundamentalism, which have resulted in the sharpest increases in disparity for a century, the marginalization of large groups of people around the world, north and south, and also what I've bluntly called a hostile takeover of governance by private interests in countries around the world. These private interests are sometimes business, sometimes religious, sometimes military, sometimes unholy coalitions of the three. But in country after country, and whether you are a indigenous community that from Ecuador or India, whether you are trying to get a global climate deal, you're witnessing the same thing. Governance held hostage by private interests. Worse than the takeover of governance, in my view, is, has been the takeover of, of mindsets by this phantom that you might label homo economicus, which reduces us all to these narcissistic, self-serving individuals who value only that that can be monetized, that where, where, the, where everything that counts can be measured, and the only things that count can be measured, 
If it, if it can't be measured, it doesn't count. If, it can't be, if you can't attach a monetary value to it, it doesn't count. Where we will, where all the other things we do as parents, as offspring, as members of communities, as volunteers, as activists, have no value because it does not, cannot be easily measured in monetary terms. There's um, a gentleman called Stuart Drakers who put it as, he says, in a to toxic alliance between politics and the marketplace, we have all been transformed from citizens with mutual needs into consumers with competing appetites. And then there was this feeding frenzy of the 80s, 90s, the uh, first decade of this century, really, which I used to describe in my early days as, as civicus as being almost an embodiment of what Mahatma Gandhi described as the seven social sins. Wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, and politics without principles. And predictably, we had the financial implosion that, and the economic and fiscal crises that followed. Yet even those did not, did not yield the kind of change that many of us in civil society expected. I mean, one of the things I think in, 2000, in late 2008, when I'd just taken over at Civicus, was this almost complacent expectation that, well, now they get it, right? Now we don't need to sort of be out of the barricades anymore. Now it's self-evident that the model is broken and, and needs to be fixed. And despite that, what you've actually got was governments determining that the banks that were too big to fail were more important than the citizens who were too small to count. <laughs>